All right, what a way to start a day, huh? Okay, so it's good to be back with you guys. We had a weekend with the boys in town, so we got to do a little uh, day trips here and there, and then we got to go down to Laguna Beach and do a little wedding last weekend. So I had some fun off, but it's so great to see all you guys here today. Uh, Today we're going to start a new series in the book of Titus. Uh, Titus is a pretty short book. It's three chapters. So uh, one of the things that I always say when we start a book, I'm so excited because uh, it's always fun for me to see what God's going to teach us as we walk through a, a new book of the Bible. Uh, you know, often if I'm honest with myself, I'm trying to figure out how many weeks do I have and what book will fit in that little space of time. And, and generally when I do that, I find that God just blows me away and I'm reminded over and over again that, that the Word of God, all of it, all Scripture, All scripture, right, is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for for correcting, for training in righteousness. And so that's that's one of the things I'm excited about as we go through Titus. Uh, Now, Titus, we don't know a whole lot about him other than what we'll find out in the book today. But we know uh, it's it's a book that's written by a guy named Paul to a guy named Titus. We don't know about a lot about Titus, but we do know a little bit about Paul, right? Paul is the guy, he was the persecutor of the church who turned into one of its greatest defenders. Uh, he was a missionary. Uh, he went all over the world. He, he suffered much for the cause of Christ. He was a defender of the truth. And Paul also is what we call a capital A apostle with an asterisk. Now, if you were with us during the the time we were going through uh, Acts, you know that that's super important to be a capital A apostle. To be a capital A guy means that you were there, right? That, That you heard the words of Jesus. You saw all the miracles. And even beyond that, you know that that Jesus anointed them in a certain way. He gifted them in a special way. The 11, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures to see how everything from the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. So it's super important. Now you might go, wait a minute, Paul wasn't there. He wasn't one of the 11. Ah, but the Damascus Road... Right? Remember Acts chapter 9 as he's walking down and Jesus makes a personal appearance to Paul and he says, you are going to be uh, my witness. You're going to testify to the things that you've seen and the things I will show to you. That I'm going to open the eyes of of the Gentiles, of those who are in darkness and and rescue them from the dominion of Satan and, and transfer them to the kingdom of God. He was going to have a super important ministry. Paul is one of those guys. And so as Paul writes to Titus, we find out that there's some trouble brewing uh, on the Isle of Crete. That's where Titus is. There's some false teachers who have kind of snuck in and they're trying to undo all the work that Paul had done. All the things, the, the groundwork that he had laid, they're coming in and they're trying to disrupt it. And so Titus, like those folks who are with him, have a choice to make. They can either listen to Paul or they can listen to the false teachers, right? There's there's only two ways because there's there's two very different worldviews there. There are two different philosophies of life that are going to collide together. So the choice they have to make is a choice that we have to make. Are we going to listen to Paul or are we going to listen to false teachers, We know who Paul is, right? I've already said that. He's a capital A with an asterisk. Here's something else you need to know. You see, the apostles didn't get to make stuff up, right? They're not writing research papers here. They're not trying to figure out pithy sayings or they're not writing an advice column to say, you know what? Here's what I think you ought to do in this situation. Every one of these guys is looking at the Old Testament and they're saying, how does Jesus fit? How do we live now that we're on the other side of Jesus coming? And so when they write, when they speak, they're speaking the very words of God. They don't get to tweak the meaning. They don't get to change it. They're going to tell us what was already there, what has always been there. It may have been embedded. We may not have seen it as clearly, but now we do. Now that Jesus has shown up, that's Paul. So Paul is going to, his theology is going to be based on uh, the Old Testament and more specifically on a correct understanding of the Old Testament as fulfilled by Jesus. The false teachers, not so much. 
They're going to base theirs loosely on the Old Testament. They're going to feel like the Old Testament is kind of backing them up. But the problem is, like we saw in Hebrews, they haven't plugged Jesus in the equation. They don't know, and so they're relying on the traditions of men. They're relying on their own wisdom. They're relying on their own appetites to guide and direct their steps. And that's going to lead to disastrous consequences. And so Titus and the folks at Crete have a choice to make. And so do we. Are we going to listen to Paul? Or are we going to listen to them? And so as we get ready, here's one of the things that I've said this often when we start a book. <laughs> the way you're going to get the most out of this study, the, the, the absolute best way is to make being here a priority, right? It's week in and week out, getting a chance to be in the book that's going to help you get the most. And it's only, we're only going to do it for the month of August, and then we'll be on to Jonah. But, but for this month, make it a priority to be here. And the other thing you could do is make it a priority that every week you're going to read through the book of Titus. You're going, oh no, a whole book? You know how long it'll take you to do that? About five minutes, maybe 10. And so if you commit, you could do that every day. So imagine if you wrote, read through the book of Titus every day while we're going through the book of Titus, you guys could teach me a lot of stuff, Right? That's the way you kind of seam in it into your heart, into your mind. That's the way that you, it becomes part of what you're meditating day and night on. And ask the Lord, what's in here for me? What, what is it? What are you challenging me with? And remember that each of these books, even though this was written to a guy named Titus, it was for a church in Crete. It was for a group of believers. And so ask, what is it for us? What is, what is uh, Paul challenging us? What is the Spirit challenging us with? Okay, so let's jump into this book. Uh, please turn to Titus chapter 1 and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and for the opportunity, Father, that you give us to spend time in your word. Lord, we don't want to take it for granted. We... Uh, or we want to be changed, we want to be transformed, we want to be made more and more like Jesus day by day. And so, Lord, as we spend time in this short little book, Lord, I, I pray that it would have a huge impact on us, not only individually, but as a church. Uh, I pray your spirit would have freedom to move and to convict us where we need to be convicted. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a look at verse 1. I feel like I'm kind of bright. Am I bright? Or is this normal? Maybe this is normal. If it's normal, that's okay. Um, I'm still bright. Okay. I feel shiny. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I got to get started here. Uh, <clears throat> there we go. Okay. Now I'm not so bright, so I'm probably not that bright anyway. So, um, Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness and the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our savior to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God, the father and Christ Jesus, our savior. Paul is going to say a whole lot in four verses, a whole lot. In fact, the, the book in kind of microcosm is packed into these four verses. Uh, he starts off much like uh, Moses does, uh, Elijah, David, um, even we saw with Peter and Jude, he's going to say, I'm a bond servant, a.k.a. I'm a slave of God. The most important thing you can know about Paul is he does not belong to himself. He belongs to another. And so Paul doesn't list his resume. He doesn't tell you all the reasons why you might listen to Paul. Paul says simply this, I'm a slave of God, which means that he gets to call the shots, not me. Paul knows that he is not the main character in his story. God is. And so he, he begins with that. Paul, a slave of God. The second thing he says is an apostle 
of Jesus Christ. We've already talked about what an apostle means, right? So in that, he's given you the, the background. He's given you the reason why. Here's why you listen. One, I'm a slave of God. Two, I'm one of those capital A guys who's been entrusted with, I'm, I'm part of the living New Testament. And when I say the living New Testament, why am I saying living? Because it hasn't been written down yet. But Titus is one of those books that once it's written down, it becomes our written New Testament. But until it's written, Paul is going to speak the words of God. Why should Titus listen to Paul? Why should we? Because he's an apostle. Paul's job is to proclaim the faith. What's the faith? What's what you got to see up here with Eduardo? Right? It's the, the message that we're sinners in need of a savior. That Jesus is the savior that God promised would come. He lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death on our behalf. He was raised the third day, conquering sin and death. And that because of that, by faith in him then, we not only get to have uh, eternal life, we get forgiveness of sins. We get adopted into God's family and all the other amazing things that come with that. He says he's writing to the chosen. The chosen are those who have believed, right? He doesn't give you a lot of detail. He says the chosen. If we go to the Old Testament, who are the chosen in the Old Testament? Israel. They're the children of God. They're the chosen people. And so in that little phrase, what Paul is saying is, you get to be a part of the people whom God has chosen for himself. You get grafted in, he's going to talk about in Romans chapter 11. You're grafted into this thing. So all the promises to to guys like Abraham and David, you get to be the beneficiary of because now you're grafted in, you're chosen, you are a believer. He's writing to the believers there in Crete. His job is to proclaim the knowledge of the truth which leads to godliness. And, And here's the thing. Right doctrine should always lead to right practice. Knowing should result in becoming, hearing and doing, not just an intellectual exercise, right? The the person who is the the most mature in the faith isn't necessarily the one who knows the most stuff because you can know a lot of stuff and be about that deep in your faith, really. You see, it's not an intellectual exercise. It's a transformation of your life exercise. The hope of eternal life. (laughs) This is awesome. I I want you to get this. Hope in the Bible is never wishful thinking. It is never, ever, ever wishful thinking. Hope in the Bible is a confident expectation based in the promise of God. And Paul says, God cannot lie. Here's an amazing thing. Not only can he, not only does he not lie, he does not lie, he cannot lie. It's against his character. So what God has said, what he's promised, he will do. No matter what, he will do. So the promise he makes in Genesis 3.15, guess what? It's going to be fulfilled. You can bank on it. So when you ask about eternal life, when was that first promised? When did hope begin? Genesis 3.15, right? That's when hope began. That's when eternal life, that's when it all in seed form is right there. And then it's manifested when Jesus shows up on the scene. So when he shows up, all that God promised about a hero now is going to be realized in a guy named Jesus. And why does Paul do what he does? Pretty simple. God told him to. Right? He does what God told him to do. On the Damascus road, Jesus said, but the, uh, but the Lord, uh, this, this is what Ananias tells Paul later on, but the Lord said to him, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for, for my name's sake. Paul is simply carrying out his orders. He's doing what he was asked to do. Titus is one who grew up under Paul's ministry. Either uh, he was brought to faith by Paul, it says, uh, my true child in in a common faith. Either he was led to faith by, by Paul 
or he was discipled by Paul. But either way, he's one who's aligned with Paul. So, so he's going to be one of Paul's guys, we could say. And one more thing, Paul mentions both God our Savior and Christ Jesus our Savior. What do you think he's saying about Jesus? Hint, he is God. I told you, there's a lot in these four verses. Let's take a look at verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward. Not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Now we're going to get to it. Paul is chosen by God. Titus then is chosen by Paul. Elders then are going to be chosen by Titus. Now here's the thing that Paul says, job number one, the most important thing that Titus can do as the pastor of this church, the most important thing, job number one is this. Well, let me tell you what it's not. It's not having an outstanding outreach ministry. It's not having the best worship in town. It's not having a really vibrant children's or, or youth ministry. Those things are all important. But he says, job number one, the most important thing you can do as a church, appoint elders. That is the most important thing. Because they are the ones who are going to safeguard the truth. They are the ones who are going to defend the truth. And without the truth of Scripture, without holding on to the truths that are in the Bible, guess what? This is just a country club. And you may feel really good about your country club. But if it's not founded on the Bible, if that's not the, the bedrock that it's, that it's built on, you got nothing. You certainly don't have a church that can challenge this culture. You don't have a church that can expand the kingdom that could push back the forces of darkness. You certainly do not have a church that can crash the gates of hell. That's why it's important that you have elders. That's what you do first. You, you appoint elders of first importance. In fact, I'd say it this way, a church only functions as it should. It only fulfills its purpose if it is founded on the tr truth of Scripture, period. So what are the qual qualifications of this, these guys? First, when he says they're bl blameless, he mentions this twice. Some of your Bibles are going to say above reproach, but blameless is the idea. Now... Any brave soul want to say you're blameless? <laughs> Nobody could say anything that you've done. And maybe if they couldn't, you know what you've done, right? So when he says blameless, we might go, oh, no, that's impossible. Well, that rules out everybody then. Now, hold on just a second. There actually is one who's blameless. Right? And because of that one who's blameless... Everyone who's trusted in him is also blameless, right? Everyone who's trusted in him, uh, because what Paul tells us elsewhere is that, that this crazy exchange happened when we trusted in Jesus. He got our sin. Guess what we got? His righteousness. So when we stand, our position before God is what? Blameless blameless. Now, I didn't say your condition. I said your position. But here's the thing. Uh, given all the other things he's going to say, I have to think he's, he is saying these guys have to have a certain trajectory about their life. 
right? That they're growing in, in this idea and their condition is becoming more like their position that they actually are walking down toward a road. They're faithfully pursuing after the kingdom, keeping their eyes on Jesus, learning to trust him more and growing in their faith that there is a trajectory that they're on that would make their condition more like their position, that when you see them, you'd go, okay, yeah, there's a guy, there's a guy. Second one, husband of one wife. Man, there's been a lots of ink spilled on this one. Uh, what does Paul mean? Does he mean one wife at a time? Does he mean faithful to the wife that you have? Does he mean that you can only be married once? In that case, if you're divorced or a widower then, and you got remarried, then that wouldn't count. But that would also mean that the person who's single couldn't be an elder, right? That, that he'd be disqualifying those folks. And so what do you mean, Paul? And if you go to, to Ty, uh, 1 Timothy 1, he didn't give you anything else. He gives you the same thing. You're going, come on, Paul, what do you mean? Well, I'll say it at, at a minimum, here's what he means. You have one wife. And you're faithful to the wife that you have. Because what's the purpose of an elder? They're going to lead the flock. They're going to be an example for those who follow them. And so husband of one wife, faithful to that wife. So when you go to Ephesians chapter 5, or you go to uh, second, or first Peter chapter 3, you're going to see what, what Peter has to say about what a husband, how a husband should love his wife. And Paul's going to say the same thing in Ephesians. How that is, because he's going to say this. Paul's going to make this bold claim. That the way that a husband and wife love each other is, the way, is a picture of Christ and the church. And so people get a, a, a kind of this view of what it looks like. The church is supposed to be when they see the way a husband loves his wife and the way she responds to him. So I'm sorry if that didn't give you enough clarity, but let's just say one husband, I mean one wife, and let's be faithful to her. Having children who believe, or maybe we should say are faithful, <laughs> Because as a parent, uh, how many parents in the room? And I know you guys want to be good parents, right? As good parents, we, we create the environment, right? We train up our children in the way that they should go. But you know what? Each and every one of our children are free agents. I can't believe for my kids. I would like to... And honestly, I'd like to make some of their choices for them so that they're not doing... Stuff that they shouldn't, right? But I can't do that. You see, God doesn't have any grandchildren. Everybody has to trust in him on their own. Everybody has to come to faith on their own. And so our job as parents, and, and what he's talking about with elders, is that they're to model what it looks like to follow after Jesus in the home, that, that, that their kids should catch them reading their Bibles, their kids should catch them saying prayers. Their kids should see them around other believers. They should see by the way they're talking and the way they're interacting with folks. They should see something different that makes the gospel attractive, that points them to Jesus. And here's what I'm going to tell you. I believe you sow those seeds when they're young. You sow those seeds in their life. And you pray, Lord, however far they stray, stray, please bring them back. Help them remember what I taught them when they were a little kid. And you believe that God will do that. Having children who believe and, and, and who are faithful. And then he goes through a whole lot of knots, right? Not accused of dissipation. That means drunkenness. Not rebellious, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious. That means they're not a bully. They're not beating people up in the parking lot. Not fond of sordid gain, right? All things I think we could agree that would be troublesome if that was your elders, right? That would be a kind of a hard thing. The flip side of the knots is he's, they should be hospitable, lovers of the good, sensible, just, devout, and self-controlled. 
And the most important thing about them is they should hold fast the word of the faithful word, right? They should hold fast the faithful word. Their job number one is to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Their job, number one job, is to protect the truth. That's their job as an elder. And so they have to be able to do that. And here's why these things are important. Because elders are God's steward. You know what a steward does? They carry out the orders, right? They, they do what, what others have told them to do. They're, they're responsible. You know who they report to? The elders? They don't report to us. They don't report to me for sure. They report to him. They're God's steward, not mine. They're not the church's steward. They're God's steward, right? They've got a huge responsibility. So they bear the weight. Every decision they make, everything they do, they bear the weight because they will have to give an account to God someday of how they led the church of their stewardship. And that's why Paul says in Hebrews chapter 13, he says, guys, they're going to have to do this. They're, they're, they, they keep watch over your souls and they will have to give an account. So don't make it hard on them. Let them do it with joy and not with grief. Elders play a huge responsibility in the church. Let's take a look at verse 10. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Here's why elders are so important because they've got to combat these bad guys, these false teachers. If, now, any comic book fans out there like DC? Anybody like Superman? Okay, three of you do? Okay. <laughs> Y'all know who Superman is, right? Ever heard of Bizarro Superman? So Bizarro Superman is like the exact opposite of Superman. So anything that Superman does, Bizarro is kind of the opposite of that. These false teachers, I would say, are Bizarro elders. They're your anti-elders. They're the opposite of what they're supposed to be. So if you look, you took the list of what Paul says an elder should be, and you look at what the false teachers are, you'd go, wait a minute, these two things are not like each other. In fact, they couldn't be further apart. There's something wrong with these guys. And for sure, they're going to cause trouble in your church. And that's why the elders are so important. Some of them, at least, they're in Crete, are potentially Jewish. He talks about circumcision. Or are at least promoting Jewish practices. They're leading folks, even whole families, astray with their false teaching. They're the epitome of the worst of what it means to be Cretan. When you see Cretan, I, I don't know why. Uh, I'm not a Star Trek fan. Any Star Trek fans? Doesn't Cretan sound like a Star Trek kind of thing? The worst of what it means to be Cretan are these false teachers. They're liars. They're, they're, la they're evil beasts. They're lazy gluttons. And here's a tricky question. Who are the elders reproving severely so that they may be sound in the faith? And the answer is not the false teachers. You see, the false teachers are unbelievers that have snuck in. The elders have to reprove believers 
who are listening to false teachers. The elders' job is to step in and to reprove those. They, they refute the false teachers. They reprove believe, believers who have been listening to them and have gone astray. The Jewish myths and commandments of men sure sound like what Jesus charged the Pharisees with in Matthew 15. In fact, that whole little section uh, kind of parallels that. Remember there, the Pharisees were getting on to Jesus because he didn't wash his hands before he ate. Now, moms, your kids should wash their hands before they eat. But Jesus says this, as they're, they're saying this, Jesus says, you guys think it's the things on the outside that, that, defile me, the, the, that defile me, but it's not that, right? It's the things on the inside. That's the thing that defiles it because <clears throat> it's out of the heart that comes murder. Out of the heart comes adultery. Out of the heart comes theft and, and, and arrogance and all every evil thing. All those things come out of the heart. And those are the things that defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands? No. Right? He says this. He says, um, he quotes from Isaiah. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They teach as doctrines the precepts of men. Right? And here's what these guys are doing. It's man-made traditions that now have become doctrine. And Paul says that's not it. That's why you need elders who are going to refute this. The false teachers then are those who profess to know God, but by their works, he says, they deny him being detestable and disobedient and worthless that's a pretty strong word, worthless for any good work. So the question is, why would you follow these guys? Why would you listen to them? Paul writes to Titus, instructing him to, get thing, to set things in order and appoint elders, men who are well qualified to lead the flock as stewards of God. And let me just say this, the importance of sound doctrine of the faithful preaching and teaching of the word cannot be underestimated. A church stands or falls based on its fidelity to the scriptures. The truth of the Bible and the truths of the Bible. It's all one story and there's not one part that's not as important as the other. It all stands or falls together. And let me just say this to you guys. You are blessed that you have a group of elders who are committed to defending and promoting the truth here. So pray for them. The flip side, watch out for those folks who, who don't have a high view of Scripture. Watch out for them. You'll know by their conduct, their character, and their conversations. Remember, out of the mouth... Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And finally, if you've not yet trusted in Jesus, today could be the day for you. It's as simple as this, acknowledging that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that Jesus is the Savior that God promised would come. He lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death on our behalf. He was raised the third day, conquering sin and death. So by faith in Jesus and in him alone, you can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and for the opportunity once again to spend time in your word. Lord, we thank you for the elders that you have appointed here at this church, Lord, for the, the, the weight that they carry, Lord. We thank you and we pray, Father, that you would strengthen them. That, Lord, that they would be sensitive to your Holy Spirit's leading and guiding in their lives, Father, that they would be ever aware of their responsibility. And, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to pray for them and to uphold them, Father, to support them. And Lord, I pray that we would spend time this week in Titus reading through the book and Lord, getting more familiar with what your, your word says. Lord, I pray that we would be a church 
that not only has a high view of scripture, but Lord, that is making you famous in this valley. I pray that we would be intentional about our relationships this week and sharing the hope that we found in Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.